all for coming today and I look forward to the conversation. We'll go around the table first for introductions and then the audience. So we'll start with my left. Uh, Christine Lundberg, uh, Mayor of Springfield. Uh, Joe Pishnery, City Council President, City of Eugene, or Springfield. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa! What a slip. Are you going to allow that to occur? I can cook quickly. Uh, I'm Mary Bridget Smith, and I'm the Acting City Manager for Springfield. Great. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Pete Torrance, Wayne County Commissioner. Joe Burney, uh, Wayne County Commissioner that has never said he was from Eugene. <laughs> wow. Okay, you can keep that check. <laughs> Sasha Vartania, Lane County. Jeff Kernan, City of Coburg, on behalf of Ann Heath, the City Administrator. Brenda Wilson with Elcog. Paul Thompson, Elcog. Uh, Bill Johnston, ODOT. Molly Carey, sitting in for Franny Brindle, who's on vacation uh, from ODOT. A2 with Lane Transit District. Kate Reed, LTD, for its member. Hi, Carl Gay with LTD. Glenn Taylor, Minutes Recorder. And Lucy Venice, Mayor of Eugene. Let me start with the front row there. Cody Frames, point to point at Lane Transit District. Keely Garvion, point to point at Lane Transit District. Emma Newman, City of Springfield. Tom Boyle, City of Springfield. Dan Collis, Lane County. Becky Taylor, Lane County. Carrie Carver, Sheriff's Office. Cliff Harrell, Sheriff. Michelle O'Leary, River Road, Santa Clara Neighborhood Plan. Great. Thank you all very much. So our first um, uh, order of business is to where, where did the comments? Okay. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes from the last from the May meeting. Do I have someone who will move to approve? Move to approve. Second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any adjustments to the agenda or calendar that we should know about? Or announcements. Or announcements. Yes, announcements. So I just want to say I asked a long time ago for both LTD and ODOT to look at the intersection at Q Street and Pioneer Parkway because it's, the MX bus runs right parallel to, to that. And there is a left turn on Q that goes on to Pioneer Parkway. Anyway, cars would actually make the mistake of getting onto the MX bus um, court, the actual lane somehow, and, but uh, between LTD and ODOT, and I don't know who to give the credit to, went out and, and not only put in some new signs that actually faced the cars that were doing the wrong things, but they painted a great big, you know, don't turn here all across the pavement also, and I saw somebody yesterday actually started to do, and I thought, oh, they're going to go down that lane and sure enough they caught themselves before they actually made the turn so I wanted to say all of that you know it took four different versions that don't do it here don't turn <laughs> to work but it actually worked really well so they weren't backing up out of the bus lane back into the traffic which is what they did before right. well, that's good to hear uh, I have to admit that I actually made that Mistake and turn once when I first moved here. <laughs> <laughs> it was very embarrassing, but I uh, backed out. It's great, especially uh, if you were in an ODOT car, huh? <laughs> <laughs> any, other, any other announcements? All right, thank you. So it is now, uh, we have an opportunity for comments from the audience. We have one person signed up, Michelle O'Leary. <clears throat> Good morning. I guess it's still morning, isn't it? A little bit for another 20 minutes or so. Um, good morning. My name is Michelle O'Leary. I'm a retired ODOT Transportation Safety Program Manager, and I am now the current uh, transportation goalkeeper for the River Road Santa Clara Neighborhood Plan. The plan is currently in its final phase of drafting action items. As part of the action planning process, we have identified a need to keep our elected officials informed on issues in our neighborhood. Also at the last MPC, I testified in support of the rapid response infrastructure improvements to Beaver Hunsaker as a result of Irene Ferguson's tragic death. 
I noted that there are many other streets, especially in the River Road and Santa Clara areas, that are similar to Beaver Hunsaker. Commissioner Bernie asked that these streets be identified and brought back to the MPC, which is why I'm here today. I reviewed feedback received at our neighborhood plan large gatherings, collaborated with our neighborhood plan working group, and asked River Road and Santa Clara residents on social media to identify neighborhood streets where pedestrians have to walk in the street, such as Beaver Hunsaker. For example, I live off of Bushnell Lane in the River Road area, which has portions of the street where there is only four to six inches of pavement to the right of the fog line, forcing you to walk in the lane of traffic. I had over 23 neighborhood streets identified. I personally walked, biked, and or drove over all of them. Some who were identified are lower priority than others. Generally, those streets near a school, park, or grocery store had higher road speed or especially egregious safety issues were given higher priority. As neighborhood leaders, we are open to exploring low-cost, low-resource solutions rather than expecting expensive infrastructure. Examples such as different striping or removing on-street parking on one side would be a start. These are not generally streets that would show up on a plan, as most are low to medium volume neighborhood streets. Normally, in my past life, I would emphasize data-driven policies to address safety problems, but this is people in our neighborhood saying that they don't want to walk with their baby stroller on the street, they don't want to let their kids ride their bike to school, and seniors who don't want to walk in their walker in the same lane that cars drive in. I have a few copies of the list with me here today, once in the public record, and, and I can email a copy to the commissioners or anyone that wants one. Um, most of the streets are in Lane County's jurisdiction. Uh, on Tuesday, a few of us from the Neighborhood Plan and River Road Community Organization met with county transportation planning staff to discuss the issues from the county streets. The meeting was productive and informing for both sides. I plan to follow up with the City of Eugene staff to discuss the city street issues as well. I look forward to continuing open dialogue about the safety of the streets in our neighborhood as we move through our neighborhood plan, planning process and beyond. Thank you, commissioners, for your concern, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. And that's so I'm open to any questions anybody might have. Are you still working on Any Anyone with a question? I'll, I'll just make a comment, which is that I had the pleasure of, of taking a walk with neighbor, the Neighborhood Act representatives in the River Road, Santa Clara neighborhood, and, and it, it, this, inter, this list will be very interesting because a lot of those roads, I mean, they're just these quiet little streets, and, but people come off River Road fast, and they're making that turn. So it, is, uh, it will be very interesting to sort of look at some of those lighter, quicker uh, cheaper ways of how can we just make those a little bit safer and warn people. So thank you sure. for that work. Thank you. We can get this email out to all. That'd so. be great. <coughs> That'd be great. <coughs> we'll share. Okay. I think we're ready for our first uh, order of business. Um, a metropolitan transportation improve. Oh, I just want to comment that Sarah Madera from the City of Jean has walked in and joined us. So for the record, one more at the table. Um, so I think staff, Dan Callister, thank you. <coughs> thank you, I'm Dan Callister from the Lane Council of Governments. This item is a proposed amendment to the Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program requested by Point to Point. The request is to program $106,268 of the MPO's discretionary federal funds to pay to cover half the cost of a Safe Routes to School coordinator position for the Safe Routes to School program in Springfield with Springfield Public Schools covering the other half. And what is specifically being requested at this meeting is a public hearing. Um, the item is open for public comment through the 28th of September and we plan to come uh, at next month's MPC to request action. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Any comments, questions about? No. Yes. Yeah, I would note that we would hold a public hearing. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anybody signed up. I'll check in a moment. Um, I'll just add that this is, uh, as is noted in the memo, bringing up funding for the Springfield School District Safe Routes to Schools program in alignment with the MPO already providing funding for the Eugene 4J and Bethel School District's Safe Process Schools programs. Um, 
Okay, great. So do we have anyone signed up to testify for a public hearing? Oh, sorry, I missed you. Okay, it was for him. Nope. The question was... Oh, I got a question for you. So you mentioned the, um, the funding for the <coughs> other school district. I know that with Springfield, it's got uh, 0 0.50 FTE funding that the school puts up, and the other 0 0.50 is, is uh, backfilled or, or matching funds. The positions you mentioned for the other districts, are they similarly set up financially? So we have point to point, and if Gilly would be able to come up and answer and help with responding to that, that would be great, or somebody else perhaps. But Thank you. So the Fort Dave Public School District position is a 1.0 FTE and it is paid for by these funds. And the Bethel Public School District position, uh, Safe House School position is 0 0.50 FTE, and it's paid for by these funds. So can you tell me why Springfield's paying for half of the position when Eugene doesn't? Uh, um, so originally there was a state grant for the Springfield Safe House School program that funded a part-time 0.5 FTE position. The school district started that um, position and saw that there was so much of a need and a desire to address um, those needs more quickly by ramping up the position to a 1.0 to be more similar to the staffing level of a 4J instead of Bethel. So is there the ability for them to fund the school district, the Springfield School District position to a 1.0 as opposed to paying for 0.5? The school district, when I've asked that question previously, said we'll pay 0.5, assuming that the 0.5 is Right, no, I understand they're willing to do that, but I'm just saying, would they not be more willing to not have to do that? Yes. So. <laughs> I would say so, or expand the program further. I would say, I'm just trying to look for checks and balances here. Yeah, Paul. Okay. Just to clarify one thing also, um, these are federal funds. There is a 10.27% match that's required, non-federal match, so in reality, federal funds are paying for 90% of the Eugene program <coughs> and, uh, you know, roughly 90% of the half-time at Bethel, um, the, the, the other funds. So 4J is kicking in a little over 10%. So it's not quite as big a difference, but I just want to... No, I'm, I'm just saying, so so will, they, will there be steps to fix that, or are we just good with that right now? I, I mean, it looks like it's inequitable to me. I think at this point, this is what Point to Point and Springfield School District agreed... Uh, be among themselves to apply for what they felt was reasonable. They certainly could ramp up their request in future years. So that's, um, so that's the longer by yeah. Springfield School District. I mean, they, it has to come from Springfield School District to say, hey, we want greater coverage for this, or? It would be either Springfield School District or point to point that would really be initiating a request for a greater, particip or greater level of federal funding towards the full-time position. Um, I think part of the reason, as, as Emma said, is that you know Springfield was looking at the fact that they had been funding this and that they wanted to increase the FTE, and in order to increase the FTE, they were looking to this funding to do that. Um, they also recognize, I think, that, I don't want to put words in their mouths, but this is a funding request that's outside of our usual NPO funding cycle, which is a competitive grant. Right. <coughs> Coming in for a one-off, they maybe you know, didn't want to ask for too much the first time. Yeah, I'm, I'm just concerned about the other side is, is where you have... Um, Let's say it doesn't say when that funding is going to end or if it's going into perpetuity. And so if you have it misbalanced now, then if this type of funding goes away, then it seems like that would be like a, a problem to be able to find those funds. So if Springfield's already paying for half of a position that they don't necessarily have to, then that could be those could be funds that could be set aside to help them in the future. But I'm just I just see the inequity of it and I, and I know I don't represent the school district. But it seems like someone from the school district should be here at this meeting saying we want full funding for that position. So just to understand that the position is fully funded, it's just from two different revenue streams except for just this one revenue stream. Right. So, so there <coughs> clearly is room in the future to look at that. Yeah, I'm just saying yeah. the school district is yeah. paying for half when other school districts aren't necessarily paying for their half. Well, they're all getting funding streams for it. Let me have a clarifying. So it's it's in it's in a cycle that will become competitive again. 
this funding request to pay would cover this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Right. Over the next eight to nine months or so, we are going to open up a next round of your MPO's competitive grant funding for all of the MPO funds. It would actually cover the fiscal years beyond these initial two. So that's when Springfield, 4J, and Bethel will have to reapply for continued funding beyond FY21. And indeed, that would be a good time for Springfield to increase their request for funding from the federal funds. Okay, so so this isn't uh, in perpetuity. This is Great. a until here, and then everybody will be in a competitive cycle. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I just hope that information gets passed on to Springfield School District that to not be afraid to ask for full funding. Yeah. So um, it's an old issue that I've always had is that we have more statistics around my, my understanding with the conversation with Springfield City staff is that the number of kids actually using the programs have it has increased quite a bit because I attended some of the safe routes to schools whether it's bike repair or whether it's ride your bike to school day or whatever and they were very sparsely attended and so I'm looking at how much money goes into the program and getting some statistics about, okay, how many kids actually walked, how many kids rode their bikes, et cetera. The other thing that I still, uh, and it's probably city staff, is where are our um, intersections, et cetera, the most, um, we've made many improvements, but probably there are ones that we need to prioritize, particularly if we're coming up into new funding cycles, is what can we do to also increase, there's no sidewalks, there's no connectivity in the middle of a neighborhood. We have done that in several neighborhoods or gotten cars to, I don't know, have the cars stopped, park, stopped parking in the bike lane across from Briggs and Yolanda, or that's still an issue. So, yes. So those kind of things is what could we do in the bigger picture that I think particularly for the city council we should be aware of as we look at our transportation needs and our and the safe routes to schools is give us some numbers as to participation, educational opportunities, and then um, the opportunities to do more in terms of actually physically making kids safer with sidewalks, et cetera, et cetera. So that, or the flashing yellow lights and things like that that help them to be safer. Right. We recently did a, a couple months ago, we did a program update for the Safe Routes to School program, which went into uh, the numbers from our October walk and roll month. We completed our May walk and roll month. I have a couple of numbers that, of, a couple of those numbers here today. Um, we can do another update to NPC if that's something you'd be interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paul? And I was going to offer the same thing. I'm sure there will be numbers available. We can do a schedule of the Safe Routes to Schools update as we've been doing regularly at NPC. We'll look at when that's appropriate. It might be November or something like that. Um, the other thing is this is programmatic funding in the Safe Routes to Schools funding world. There's sort of two sides. There's programmatic funding for the coordinator and then there's infrastructure <coughs> funding. Right. Certainly for the physical improvements, that's more the infrastructure funding side. But um, you know, I would encourage Springfield and all the other jurisdictions to look at those needs and certainly mm -hmm. apply on the next round of funding that I just referred to for those infrastructure needs as opposed to these coordinator needs. And then the other thing is, um, you know, getting a report in the next couple of months on the numbers recently for Springfield can be contrasted over the next two years if you approve this funding with yeah. what changes results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and that, that's really what I'm looking for is, you know, what, when, what, are we improving? You know, and if, if we are, great, and if we're not, what do we need to do to improve it? Right. We recently had the hire of uh, two program assistants for the Safe Routes to School program, uh, which are point-to-point -point employees, um, both half-time and they were hired specifically to boost our encouragement programs. So there's been a marked focus on increasing uh, participation events, participation at our encouragement events, which looks like uh, bike rodeos, uh, bike trains in the morning, drop-offs, uh, all the events that you would have attended at schools. Okay, great, thank you. Great, great. So do we have anyone signed up for a public hearing? There was comment? no one signed up this time. All right, so we will open and close that public hearing. <laughs> thank you. 
All right. Next up. Thank you very much for that report. Next up, uh, Title VI Committee Survey. I handed out at each place a survey, and if you don't have one, let me know. I have a couple of extra printed here. Um, as a federal a recipient of federal funds, we are required to do some reporting under Title VI, which is intended to protect um, discrimination against race, color, or national origin. So what we do is we do a annual report on that every fiscal year, and right now I'm compiling that information. And part of that is surveying our committees. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you have any questions about the survey, let me know. Um, there is an option to check if you're an alternate, a designated alternate. Um, so that might just, if you don't know if you're an alternate, let me know. <laughs> so if you have any questions, um, and if, you're, if you could complete it here today, that would be great. And then I'll collect it at the end of the meeting. Good. Great. Any comments or questions around this? Oh. Yeah. Is there a, a distinction between race, race and ethnicity? I don't think we just... We don't discriminate on the survey. You don't say. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you very thank much. You. That was that was short and sweet. Yep. Uh, next up is the Lane County Sheriff. So this is a follow up from a request from you as NPC to engage with the sheriff on um, some questions around. Specifically, I think transportation safety. Um, these discussions <coughs> occurred really around the discussions that this body had um, last spring around the Beaver Hunsaker corridor, um, fatality and safety issues and funding. <coughs> so uh, that's all I have to say, and I believe there's a presentation to start and a discussion to follow. I'm going to move. I'll get out of the way. There's a little, uh, there it is. <coughs> Well, thank you all uh, so much for uh, an invitation to be here. Uh, my name is Cliff Harold, so I've had the privilege of being uh, the sheriff since April when the Board of Commissioners appointed me to the office when uh, Sheriff Trapp retired. Um, <clears throat> I'm very, very uh, honored by the appointment, and I care a lot about the organization. Just a little bit about me. I grew up in, uh, in Lane County uh, in Cresswell. Uh, born and raised on a family dairy farm. If you've been to the Emerald Valley Golf Course in Crestwell, there's a stinky dairy farm just north of there. That's, that's where I was uh, growing up. And became associated with the Sheriff's Office at the age of 16 in the Explorer Post. Um, and through my association with the Sheriff's Office, ultimately I, I uh, had the privilege of being a, uh, offered a job as a Deputy Sheriff when I was 21. So I've worked with the organization for about 25 years. I've worked almost every assignment there is in the Sheriff's Office. And uh, I care very much about the organization and the people, about 300 people that make up the Sheriff's Office and the work that we do. Uh, so thanks for letting me be here. I like to talk about the office, so I appreciate the opportunity. I know that your um, focus in this meeting is, is traffic and traffic safety, and I know that you're familiar with sort of the three-leg stool of traffic safety being, as we have on the screen, enforcement, engineering, and education. Um, and I know that we have uh, folks making strong efforts in all of those three uh, uh, legs within the county, uh, but obviously uh, outside of any city limits that provides for its own law enforcement, we struggle to provide the enforcement angle. Um, part of my career history with the Sheriff's Office, when I asked for a transfer out of the Corrections <coughs> Division into patrol, I uh, was on our traffic safety team. Uh, we had 10 deputy sheriffs involved in a specific mission for traffic safety when I moved on to the team. It grew to 12 shortly thereafter. As we struggled with funding, the, the team increased in size and at one point was 20 deputy sheriffs, um, specifically for the mission of traffic safety and, and of course, uh, combined with a justice court system in the county and et cetera. So I'm definitely a believer in the mission of traffic safety. Uh, I was a 23-year-old uh, kid working traffic safety on the night shift. I arrested a lot of DUI drivers, led the agency in do Dewey arrests, um, but I also went to a lot of crashes, and in particular, what stands up to my memory is I, I saw a lot of, of dead high school kids in car crashes in my early years 
uh, mostly. Excuse me, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I can put the screen down. It's just going to take a little bit of noise. Do you mind? Uh, sure. No, that'd be great. We'll, we'll get it down. Thank you. Sure. It might be easier to read. Uh, most of the crashes that I went to, of course, were in uh, unincorporated Lane County. That's our patrol area. So predominantly we were talking about um, the more rural high school kids who tended to recreate out on logging landings and such and engage in underage drinking. And, and so, uh, so I've, I've seen my share of fatal car crashes, and I'm a believer in the traffic safety mission. Uh, that said, I did it for about three years, and... Even though I knew that my job was saving lives by affecting driving behavior, when almost everybody you talk to accuses you of being a tax revenue collector, it does wear on you <clears throat> at some point. Um, also, just sort of the, the internal pressure of being out there uh, generating your own activity. It was all self-initiated activity. And so eventually I requested a transfer into a, a patrol position where dispatch tells you what to do and uh, you go handle the call. And, less self-initiated stuff. Um, from 08 to 12, our agency lost 200 positions. The Sheriff's Office lost 200 positions from 2008 to 2012. We laid off 100 people. That's from both, division, both of our major operational divisions, corrections and patrol. So not all of those positions came out of patrol. Since the community has um, uh, supported our public safety levy, we've added back 67 positions, but those are all corrections division positions because the public safety levy is very specifically to provide for the function of corrections. So that has not improved our patrol situation at all. We're very grateful to the community for the support to improve our corrections facility, but it hasn't improved our, our patrol situation at all. So today I have budgeted 25 deputy sheriff positions to provide county law enforcement. From the mountaintops to the ocean, you know how big Lane County is, 4,600 square miles. 25 positions uh, equals about three deputies on, a, on any given shift, and in fact, our minimums are three deputies on day shift and swing shift. We'll post overtime to, to make sure we have three deputies on those two shifts. And then on the graveyard shift, we'll actually go down to two deputies and one sergeant to cover Lane County. Uh, so obviously, if you have two deputies and one sergeant and it's three in the morning and they're going to a dispute call, they're all going. And that could be to Dune City or it could be to McKenzie Bridge, or it could be to Oak Ridge, or it could be to South of Cottage Grove. Um, so that's the, that's the status of our current county law enforcement. Now those 25 positions, actually, for the patrol function, I have more people than that, but that's because of our contract services. So uh, we contract with a number of, of agencies. The two biggest are the city of Crestwell and the city of Anita, both contract with the sheriff to be their police force within the city. Uh, the BLM contracts uh, with us for two deputy sheriffs to patrol BLM lands within the county. Um, our newest contract is actually with Lane County Public Works. They are contracting with us to do motor carrier enforcement, so uh, truck enforcement, and uh, in, in a couple of other functions that serve the roads function for Lane County Public Works. And so we're super excited about that contract, and, and it started off great, and uh, we're happy to have it. Because of those contracts, um, I actually have about 50 people in the police division, 50 deputies. So. Half of them, though, are contracted to a specific person who pays to have them do a specific function. So I can't use those deputies to go to Dune City for a dispute. I can't use those deputies to go work traffic enforcement in a neighborhood that has called us over and over again being frustrated about traffic. We had a, uh, a, a the police executive research forum come in and study us to say, hey, is there anything we could do to be able to provide better service with our limited resources and ultimately they said across the nation we don't think there's anybody like you uh, and we don't know how you get done what you get done and the reality is you need five more positions to keep doing what you're already doing let alone add anything to your plate. Uh, so, so that's where that landed. I've rambled on and on and haven't even changed the slide once. Um, I was mentioning that I'm, I'm a believer in the traffic safety, the traffic enforcement function. Uh, you all are probably familiar with this but our society tends to uh, certainly pay attention to and focus on violent crime, as it should, uh, but oftentimes our society gives much less consideration to the impacts that a fatal car crash has. It has uh, the same sorts of impacts on families. Um, yeah, as you can imagine, parents that have to be notified that their um, child died in a car crash. I have a 16-year-old son who started driving in June. 
Uh, so that's got a whole new level of impact to me. Uh, just, just now talking to you about parents getting that notification, it's like, oh, I'm going to stop talking about that. Um, but as a society, we just uh, we don't we do, we choose not to think about the significant impacts that uh, traffic crashes have, like we do think about violent crime. Um, some of the things that we have been doing, a partnership with Lane County Public Works, we have the speed feedback signs. The sheriff's office has had for a number of years a speed trailer that uh, various neighborhoods that are out in the county jurisdiction. Uh, call us and complain about speeds on their road. We can take the speed trailer out. That's a, a feedback sign. One of the newest things that we started doing, and by the way, I should have introduced Sergeant Kerry Carver uh, behind me to my left. Kerry is uh, not only the PIO for the Sheriff's Office, but she has a whole bunch of other hats too. Volunteer coordinator is one of them. And Kerry and her volunteers have started a program where they uh, not only do they go park the speed trailer in different neighborhoods but we've also trained the volunteers to use handheld radar guns and they will go sit in a neighborhood where we've received complaints of speeding and they will record license plates for vehicles that they see uh, that are about 10 miles an hour over the speed limit and then we're sending a letter to that to the registered owner of that vehicle to say hey we measured your speed on this date at this time on this road um, you know, you're going too fast, please be considerate of your neighbors, think, you know, think about this. Uh, if we get the, the same vehicle a second time within a certain period of time, then we send them a another letter that says, we got you again. Uh, we really, really mean it. Slow down. Um, at this point, you know, that's, that's the best we can do, but we're leveraging volunteer hours uh, to do something. And one thing that I'll share with you, so growing up in Cresswell, and I still live in, in, just outside of Cresswell, I think every community has probably a Facebook page now, you know, the Community Connections Facebook page. So the Crestwell Community Connections page was lit up because our volunteers were sitting in a, in a Jeep measuring traffic as they entered Crestwell from the, from the west side on Camaswell Road. It goes from a 55 rural roadway uh, to a 25 just before Crestwell Middle School. And they're sitting there in an unmarked white Jeep, but people can see that they're holding the radar gun out the window. And so all over that group was, slow down when you come into town. They're measuring speed. They're out there, you know, speed <laughs> trap. Um, so if you think about that, you know, obviously the impacts of that are, that's kind of what we're looking for. We want people to pay attention, slow down, be a little more purposeful. It's not going to uh, work for everybody, but certainly that sort of information getting out to the community is, uh, is beneficial. Uh, the other thing that you probably hear about, and from time to time we put out the news releases about the uh, safety blitzes. So we get grant money. It's currently distributed through the Oregon State Sheriff's Association to do um, Dewey enforcement, seatbelt enforcement patrols. It's all overtime money. Uh, it's great. We appreciate the opportunity. But the reality is I'm going to go back to the number of staff I have. And I said I had 25 budgeted positions. Of those 25 budgeted positions throughout the summer, I've had 65% of them actually working. We had uh, three shoulder surgeries, a broken arm, and a pregnancy that impact our workforce, and then um, some vacancies where we're training. Uh, so just to cover our shifts, our folks are working overtime. And, and again, if you think about three deputies covering the county, you get sent to Dune City on a dispute. Um, and 30 minutes later, it's the end of your shift. It really doesn't matter. You're going to finish what you're doing. You're going to travel back to the main office. You're going to write the report if you made an arrest. Um, in a, in a metro police agency, say, when you're 30 minutes away from in a shift, you're in the shop cleaning up, ready to be done, because there's other folks out on the street handling the calls. Not, not necessarily like that for us. So our folks work lots of overtime. So we, we send out an email, say, hey, we've got traffic safety overtime. Sign up for a shift. And they say, Ugh, I'm working plenty. Um, so it's a little harder to, to get folks to fill these than it once was. Um, and then I guess, too, we could always have the conversation about the difference in the workforce today, the folks that we are hiring that are new into the profession versus when I was new into the profession and um, priorities that folks have in their life now. They want to have weekends, and that's a good thing. That's healthy. They want to see their families, and that's a good thing. That's healthy. Um, I want them to have long, successful careers where they enjoy it, not only at the beginning when it's super fun and new, but also at the end uh, and not resenting that they've missed out on a, a lot of stuff because of all the hours that they worked. So I don't blame them. I didn't want it sounding like a complaint, but it is one thing that we're, we're working with, and the reality is, at this point, more grant overtime, more grant dollars for overtime is not much of a solution for us. We struggle to spend 
the grant dollars we have that are limited to overtime expense. We just don't have enough full-time employees to spend it. Uh, we do leverage those grants really well to help us uh, have at least a somewhat acceptable level of presence during the Oregon Country Fair. The Oregon Country Fair brings 20,000 people out to Vanita, which is normally a 5,000 people town. And um, it's a big deal to have the population go up that much for a weekend and be engaged in some of the activities they are and not have any ability to really be present. Um, so we are able to leverage these dollars not only to keep people safe because there is a mix of vehicles and pedestrians during that event, but also to have deputies there in, in the event that we're needed for other things. Uh, you probably know a little bit about the fatal crash investigation team. Um, so we get together with engineering and public health, risk management, legal counsel to talk about fatal crashes that happen in the county and, and if there are things that can be done to improve the situation and, and mitigate the situation. So um, we are involved in that to the extent that we're able. We have representation on it. Uh, we have two deputy sheriffs who have been trained to do a higher level of traffic crash investigation, which uh, is a significant amount of training, by the way, and a lot of math. Um, and then we have some specific uh, equipment needs. For example, I, I just recently found out Springfield acquired a uh, Faro scanner, which is exciting news. It used to be Eugene was the only one that had one, so now we have two different people we can call and ask for help from uh, when we need that level of equipment. Historically, the Sheriff's Office has leaned on the Oregon State Police to help us with fatal crash investigation when we think it might be a prosecutable death. So. If we go to a fatal crash, it's a single occupant, uh, single driver, single you know, vehicle into a tree, no prosecution. We don't do that highest level of an investigation because there's not going to be a criminal prosecution. Uh, but in any case where there might be a criminal prosecution, we want to do the very best investigation we can. And that involves people and equipment and expertise. The state police used to be able to provide that for us pretty regularly. The Springfield State Police Office today uh, while billeted for 21 troopers, they only have 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, so increasingly they, are, they have been unable to provide that service for us. So we did send two of our staff to um, get back into the business of having that higher expertise level to investigate these crashes. Um, and, and of course we continue to work closely with OSB. They helped us out just earlier this week with one. But um, that's, that's where that is. Um, probably have seen this before. It's been part of Lane County's budget uh, process for some time. Um, you all probably already know this, but Lane County was uh, doing well with timber revenue for a number of years. We have a dollar twenty-eight per thousand tax rate because the county didn't need to collect a ton of property taxes. They had timber dollars. Uh, the timber dollars have gone away. Uh, we still collect a buck twenty-eight per thousand for county tax, and so that's why we have. Uh, you know, when I when I first became acquainted with the Sheriff's Office in 1995 as my hire date. Uh, we knew that we were under-resourced as an organization to provide services to the county that we do. Uh, and today, much to my disbelief, I would give my left arm to have what we had in 1995. It's gotten worse, not better. Um, that said, I just have to say again, I said it when I started, I'm so proud of the organization. The people that work for the Sheriff's Office are phenomenal. They work so hard. It's unbelievable what they get, they get done. And honestly, I love the culture of the Sheriff's Office partly because they all share in this experience of having too much work to do. And so there's very little room for petty disagreements and, and some of those things because uh, everybody's just working too hard. <laughs> so there's, there are some pos positives. Um, Marion County is our closest comparable county. So when we come to labor uh, agreements, we compare with uh, Jackson Deschutes, Washington Clackamas, and Marion. But Marion is really our closest comparable county. Um, Marion County's tax rate is about $3 per thousand. If we applied Marion County's tax rate to Lane County, we'd have about $53 million a year more to figure out what to do with. Um, $53 million would, would go a long, long ways to providing a, a more robust public safety system. Um, but that's not the situation that we're at, obviously. Um, this slide talks a little bit about officers per thousand, which is sort of the standard for comparison. Uh, as recently as a year ago, the Register Guard was reporting about the city of Eugene and their officers per thousand. 
They had previously been at 1.2, they were down to 1.12, they were trying to get back to 1.2, and I think uh, they're pretty close to 1.2 and maybe working towards 1.4 per thousand now. Um, my rough math is City of Springfield is roughly one officer per thousand by population. If you look at the national average of 2.4, that's really East Coast affected. The East Coast is a really dense area, both law enforcement and population. So 2.4, way, way outside of West Coast norms. Um, and then we also recognize as a sheriff's office, we police differently than cities. Folks who live out in the county have a little different expectation of their police than they, than they do in the city. And uh, so or, uh, sheriff's offices in general don't have the high officer per thousand ratio that a municipal <coughs> police department does. So we compare ourselves to the other 35 counties in Oregon. Their sheriff's uh, number of sheriff's deputies for the patrol function, so removing the corrections function, the non-policing function. Um, and the Oregon average is 0.8 deputies per thousand per county population. Um, but then we look at that and we say, okay, well, Harney County only has 5,000 people in it. So that kind of skews the ratio too, right, if you have a really small population base. So we looked at Marion County, our closest comparable. They're at 0.35 deputies per thousand, which sounds ridiculously low because it kind of is. But we're at 0.18. For us to get to 0.35, we'd have to hire 63 more deputies to do the function of policing that we have 25 deputies for today. So... We're the only uh, metro county in Oregon that had this timber dollar dependency. There's other counties that had it, certainly mm -hmm. Josephine, Coos, et cetera, but nobody that has the metro population that Lane County has. Um, so I was going to share with you some numbers. They're not on the, the PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> but obviously with the staffing we have, our deputies are, are an emergency response force. Uh, even the PERF study said that you your folks don't have any discretionary patrol time. Uh, when I look at the call screen, there's anywhere from 10 to 20 calls pending for those three deputies. Uh, they go to one call, they go to the next call. They see traffic safety issues while they're en route to calls. Occasionally, one of them will get on the radio and, and they, they know that their friends or, or, or colleagues want them to get to the call and they feel guilty about making a traffic stop, so they'll to actually give a little additional information on the radio. I have to stop this car because of this behavior. It's going to delay my response to that call. So in, in really serious situations, they'll make that traffic stop. But since predominantly our first priority is life safety in progress calls, they're almost always going to default to going to the call versus doing anything about the traffic thing that they just saw. Um, when we had a traffic team, so from 2005 to 2009, the Sheriff's Office average number of traffic citations was 24,826 citations a year. So just under 25,000 traffic citations a year back when we had a traffic team. Uh, in 2018, we had 2,793. So just under 3,000 citations versus just under 25,000 citations. Um, DOI, as I mentioned, I was a nighttime traffic guy, and so I started my shift and did a lot of traffic enforcement. Uh, and then as the, the night turned into early morning hours, I did a lot of looking for DOI drivers. And so uh, we averaged about 500 DOI arrests in 05, 06. In 07, we went up to 730 DOI arrests, and also 08, 730. Um, in 18, we had 247. In 17, we had 206. In 16, we had 203. Probably, and there's a fair amount of those that are still officer-initiated observations of intoxicated drivers. But a lot of those are crash response. So after the fact, DUI investigations versus catching them before the crash. Contract services. So I mentioned those before, and um, that we've had, you know, good success with our contracts. One of the things I've noticed. So we will assign a deputy to go work the Crestwell contract, and now all of a sudden they're leaving an environment where they're crisscrossing the county call response, and they actually have some discretionary patrol time, 
And what we're finding is, as an agency, when we had that traffic safety team, when we were training new deputies, you did a, a phase of training with the traffic team. So you did a couple phases with call response, then you did a traffic phase, and you finished up with a call response phase. We don't have the traffic team anymore, so we're, not, we're missing that traffic enforcement phase. And we're finding we're sending deputies to a contract where they have some time to do it, and they're not very well equipped for it. Because we're, we're kind of losing that piece of our culture where it's part of what we do is traffic safety enforcement. Um, so we've recognized that and we're starting to um, make an effort to change it. One of the things we're gonna do and have done is we've pulled a field training officer off of the schedule for a week when the, with their trainee and said, okay, you're not doing call response this week. Go teach, go teach your new deputy how to do traffic enforcement uh, like we used to do. Um, so we're trying to take some steps to, to counteract that, but uh, from a guy that grew up in the traffic team, it's kind of startling to realize sort of how that culture changes over time um, and so yeah so we're so we're going to work on it uh, Cresswell and Benita both have municipal courts and so the deputies assigned to those two cities write uh, citations within the city limits into the municipal courts of those two cities um, they have some better equipment because the cities help uh, pay for some better uh, speed detection equipment and etc one of the things that I've been talking about since I became sheriff is that I feel really uh, fortunate that I inherited a situation where that corrections division has been stabilized. Sheriff Turner worked really, really hard to get a jail levy passed. Uh, sheriff Trapp worked really hard to get it renewed. And while we don't have the corrections function, honestly, that we should have for the population of the county, uh, it's stable. And we're not releasing serious violent offenders. We're not releasing Measure 11 offenders. And so that's good. And I'm thankful for that. And I feel like that gives me the opportunity to try to work on this, uh, not having sufficient staff to provide that part of our mandate. Um, the sheriff is the conservator of the peace for the county, and so I, I consider that a, a, statutory, a statutory mandate to be able to have a response to go keep the peace in the county when the peace needs kept. Um, so I want to work on that. What I'm finding out with my new job all of four months and actually, I, I learned it maybe a couple of years into being chief deputy, is that all things are complicated. It's like a rule. All things have to be complicated. You want to think that they can be easy, but they can't. Um, I've been having a lot of com community conversations, going to keep doing that. What I'm talking about at this point is this idea of this Cresswell Vanita model elsewhere in the county doesn't necessarily have to be an incorporated city. Uh, with the incorporated city, they're collecting city taxes and using that to contract with us, so that, that simplifies things. But for example, McKenzie Highway uh, from city limits of Springfield all the way up has historically been a really great neighborhood, very supportive of the Sheriff's Office. We have a lot of neighborhood watch groups up there, a lot of communication with the office. And they've had this experience where we applied for federal COPS grants and got them, and so we assigned a deputy to be a, a community deputy for that whole community. And so the folks that have lived up there long term, they have this experience of really only having access to the emergency response force of the countywide patrol. Then they have a deputy who's assigned to their area. Now, he, that deputy's only working 40 hours a week, minus training and vacation, but still, that deputy starts to develop community relationships. People <coughs> recognize the face, They're like, oh, that's our deputy. And you start solving crime that way. Because rather than just going and taking a burglary report because somebody said their house got broken into, you also have three other people that are calling you saying, hey, I saw Joe's kid out late, and he looked like he was up to no good, or, or whatever. <laughs> and so we assigned a resident deputy up there. We solved, we, we solved about three burglary cases and made an arrest, and then property crime goes down. And that community, they can really feel that. They all communicate up and down the river, and they feel that difference. The COPS grant ran out. We don't have the ability to, to put anybody up there anymore. Uh, we have to have them into the, in the main office just to keep the three deputy coverage. And so now the community feels the property crime coming back in, and they miss their <coughs> deputy. They used to have a deputy, now they don't, and they miss that. So we've been having conversations with them about what that looks like, a, a district deputy, sort of the Crestwell model, but say, hey, McKenzie Highway, you know, if you combine use the boundary of the fire districts, the McKinsey Fire District and the Upper Fire, uh, Upper McKinsey Fire District, and you use that boundary and say, hey, would you all be interested in having a district to have an assigned deputy, a community resource? Our cars down in Cresswell say Sheriff, and then underneath it says Cresswell. Same in Vanita. So what if we had a car that was driving up and down the McKinsey Highway that said Sheriff, and then it said McKinsey District? And that's your deputy, and it's a community policing model. 
And people are pretty excited about the idea, but of course it's complicated. You're talking about forming a district. Um, and lots of folks in this room probably know about this thing called the Metro Plan. The Metro Plan speaks to special service districts that impact urban growth boundaries. Um, and so we're talking about all those things, um, sort of figuring out what the, what the future, what the way forward might be. But it feels the most energized conversation I've had to date is this idea of sort of localized resources versus trying to go out countywide and say, hey, we don't have enough deputies. Countywide, would you support more deputies? What I, the feedback I get from that conversation is that folks that are in Dune City are convinced they'll pay more taxes for more deputies for Santa Clara and that they won't actually see the resource. So I feel this sort of energy from folks when they, they know we're talking about a localized resource. Um, and that's fun. I love having those conversations. So we're going to keep having those conversations. I'm, I'm interested to see, interested to see what, what comes of it. Um, happy to hear from any of you all anytime. Reach out if you have a brilliant idea and, and uh, know just how to fix this problem. Uh, one thing, obviously, I've realized is there's a reason it's been a problem for 30 years. The, the answer isn't easy. Um, but I'm interested in continuing to work on it. And that's my update. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Also sobering. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Well, I just want to say, first of all, uh, the Sheriff's done a great job of giving that overview, and we're uh, uh, really happy that he uh, uh, accepted the appointment to this office. I just want to highlight one really important component of, of what was mentioned, and that is that Lane County uh, had the dubious distinction for several years running of the highest death rate from car crashes in the state. Way beyond our comparator counties that we talked about, uh, Jackson, Joseph, uh, Jackson uh, Deschutes, Marion, um, uh, uh, Washington, and Clackamas County. Way beyond that, way larger even than Multnomah County itself that is the largest county in the state. So. All those crashes, not all, most of those crashes occurred outside of Eugene and Springfield that have good uh, transportation planning and have good law enforcement and uh, the, the components that were talked about. So we had this horrible situation, we still have this horrible situation of all these crashes. So the county in, in, in the various entities of the county, risk management, legal, um, uh, transportation and law enforcement have come together to form something called the Fatal Crash Investigation Team. It was mentioned in the presentation. Uh, not only is the uh, sheriff involved in that, not only is the Board of Commissioners, but uh, Ms. Taylor, who many of you know from her presentations here from Lane County Public Works, very innovative because normally these crash investigation programs are internal to organizations because the legal people are concerned, oh, well, that means we're going to get sued because somebody was killed because we didn't do the engineering right or they said we didn't do the engineering right. And so uh, our, our legal counsel has been very integrated into this to provide for appropriate uh, commu uh, county involvement across the board. And they've been getting invitations around the country. How did you do this? How did you do this? So I, I'm really happy that the sheriff's involved in that. And then last but not least is for those of you that are connected to an entity uh, such as a school district, uh, LTD as a district, uh, perhaps um, the uh, smaller cities uh, in the county that don't have this contract, that would be another way that we could try to do something about this uh, law enforcement problem on the uh, on the short term. The longer term, a district, a sub-district, uh, a couple school districts or fire district to form it. That's something that we have done. Uh, we have attempted, I should say, we <laughs> the done part is we attempted it. Uh, the not done part is we have not built much on it. And, 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 I think it was three years ago we had a meeting in Venita, uh, north, uh, uh, excuse me, south of Venita for a district proposal. The advocates came in, made a great case, and they were shouted down by about a 10 to 1 ratio by the opponents 
and that was the end of that. So trying it again um, in another context might work. Uh, getting more of these things, you know. So I just want to thank you for coming. It's a great idea. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Sure, Paul. Yeah, uh, so, Mayor and then So I want to always, I know it's, it's a drum I beat on a lot, but it is, you know, we were a timber dependent county for a long time, and that money paid for a heck of a lot, whether it was roads, public safety, our schools were got funding for it. And over time, that that's the graph that I always want to refer to. It just went down to nothing. So, but I want to revisit that because we have sustainable yields that we are supposed to be able to <coughs> harvest to that provides timber receipts for exactly what you need. And as long as we fight it and don't actually support that, it's it, we're always going to be in this scenario unless we look for more tax dollars that are already coming from the folks that may be on the very edge of affordability in their houses. And I don't want to keep doing that is we put more people in a precarious position because we keep taxing everybody. So as long as we have a resource that we can capitalize on and use the resource for funding sheriff patrols, which I, we can all agree that's a great thing, is that we should be trying to promote that rather than squash it in one way or another. And Senator Wyden has very carefully crafted with Senator Merkley the bill that they have that creates an endowment at the federal level that would guarantee funding on a permanent basis if we could all get behind that, it's not going to solve the whole problem, but certainly it adds to the amount of resources that we have at our disposal to spend on public safety that we want and to have share. Because I remember when they patrolled in Springfield and I went, what the heck, we have Springfield police, but the share patrols were in Springfield because there were enough patrols to go around. So. I want us not to forget that there, we have access to that and the sustainable yields are nowhere near clear-cutting everything. They are just simply sustainable yields. And as long as our senators are working hard to make that a reality, I think we should support it. Our lobbyists are coming. We go back to D.C. every year. And I think we should be able to support that so that we can have our patrols. It can affect Beaver and Hunsaker. It can affect all of the places where we are dependent on county patrols to help us be safe. So I just, you know, always looking at where the heck we can make it a better situation for all of us. Thank you. Councilor? So uh, this is, I've been thinking about that. I've had time to think about some of those things that you mentioned. And um, as a short term, possible short term solution, they may have already been explored. Um, and I know that there's mutual aid agreements, but perhaps through separate IGAs through the different agencies that when you come up and you have projects such as, you know, sign a project code to something that's going to cost you over time, such as the, the country fair or uh, a specific events, et cetera, that you could uh, subscribe to assistance from other outside agencies such as Springfield or Eugene PD, et cetera, through those IGAs to back pay them through those project funds and um, to at least make that available, the overtime available for those agencies where those officers can, can sign up for that overtime while they're not working a regular shift and cover the costs for the cities or those agencies so that way at least those police services are provided during those events to protect the public in general. Um, has that been explored? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I worked the Friday night of Oregon Country Fair this year. I've, I've only missed one year of not working a shift during the Oregon Country Fair. And uh, we had two Springfield motor officers out there and a Eugene uh, motor officer. And they were using traffic safety grant dollars also that the cities, uh, their, uh, their chain of command allowed them to use those grant dollars for traffic safety in support of us and that mission out there. It was fantastic. We used to have a motors program, which 
particularly regarding Oregon Country Fair, where you're mixing vehicles and pedestrians on a county roadway, uh, the motor officers are so much more able to, to effectively uh, interact. And so it was fantastic to have the support from the cities. And so, yeah, we, we have and, and continue to. Okay, any other comments? Thank you very much. It was very informative. Thank you. And helpful. We appreciate Thank you, you joining us today. And next up, May is Bike Month. We'll report on hmm? <laughs> Welcome. So um, my name is Shane Rhodes, and I'm with the City of Eugene uh, in Public Works Transportation Planning. And we're here today to talk a little bit about uh, and share what we did this past year with May is Bike Month, and um, a little bit about um, potentials for the future as well. And I'm Emma Newman uh, with City of Springfield, so we partnered for a number of years on this effort. Um, I realized I didn't add Shane to the front slide because we were supposed to present initially in July and then your meetings were canceled. So here we are in September giving you an update about May. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah. So May's Bike Month has a long history uh, around the country. Uh, it's been uh, going since 1956, uh, celebrated. Uh, with the League of American Bicyclists and other organizations and communities around the country holding different events. Uh, in our region, we have a long history of different types of bike events from Human Powered Fridays, Business Commute Challenge, Walking Bike to School Day, lots of different events that have been happening for decades. We have a long history of uh, biking in our community in general. Uh, but uh, this specific month of May is Bike Month, uh, we've been doing since 2014 um, and the real effort for this month has been to gather all the partners that were already doing some really great events uh, and uh, and then do a uh, co-marketing co-branded uh, one big push and get everyone involved on the same page and really encourage a lot of other community members to get involved and to be engaged with this uh, project as well so some of this work started with uh, the growth of our Safe Routes to School programs and a lot of events that were happening at different schools uh, with walking back to school uh, challenges and walking back to school days. Uh, and so our partners range from the uh, school districts, the City of Eugene, City of uh, Springfield, LTE Point-to-Point -point Solutions with the addition of Peace Health Rides last year in Eugene. Uh, they've also become a great partner, University of Oregon and their transportation department and their bike program as well, uh, and Willamette Lane and local advocacy organizations like Gears and Best uh, that have been doing uh, different projects, all to encourage people to try out biking if they haven't tried uh, riding, to encourage those who are already riding to uh, celebrate that and to get um, their friends and family and coworkers engaged and involved uh, to ride more often as well. This past year we started a, uh, a co-branded site called We Bike Lane for everyone to use as a common calendar for all the different events that are happen happening throughout the region. People can, can submit events that they're holding, whether it's an education class or a ride or some free event. They can put that on the calendar and it shows up automatically and so there's one go-to source for all the great events that are going on. Uh, during that month, and so we had uh, almost at least one event a day and over uh, about 50 events that happened throughout uh, that month. So briefly, I'd like to touch on how this aligns with the policy um, goals, both at the state level, regional level, as well as um, some of the more specific programs we have in our area. So the transportation planning rule uh, has various policy elements that talk about reducing single occupancy vehicle trips and promoting biking in our area definitely helps with that. Um, you're familiar as a body with the Regional Transportation Plan and the Regional Transportation Options Plan within that, so this aligns uh, the City Transportation System Plans, 
As Shane touched on, uh, Safe Routes to School has the Walk and Roll Challenge in May, which is convenient timing to cross-promote things happening in the schools, things happening through employers, things happening in the broader community. Uh, this year, I had someone from a local church in Springfield approach me and say, hey, we're doing this bike-related thing. Can you promote our flyer and let people know about this barbecue and bike event we're having over at a church? Come on out. So you never know what might bubble up from just community organizations or an individual saying, I have an idea, I want to do it. Let's get it on the calendar and make it happen. Um, and then Point to Point has been a great partner uh, with the Business Commute Challenge that specifically is focusing on the employer piece of things during the same month. So a few highlights from this year. Um, in 2019, we, uh, both mayors did proclamations at city council meetings about bike months, highlighting some of the things that have recently happened. Uh, this year in Springfield, the mayor spoke about the Springfield Museum exhibit, which was kind of a one-off special event here in Springfield, where throughout the whole month of May and into June, there was an exhibit around biking in Springfield and the history of biking here. Um, there was an individual who donated uh, or loaned us a number of his bicycles from a personal collection that are really, really cool. Uh, we pulled out some bike license registration information from the archives about how people used to register their bikes with the Springfield Police Department. It's amazing what you find when you have an event around biking. Uh, the Art Walk in Eugene kicked off the whole month of activities. There were month-long promotions at various businesses that would say, you know, you get a dollar off if you ride your bike to our business, if it's a restaurant, those sorts of things. Uh, the Springfield Library already does story times, but they were a great partner. They joined in a huge way this year to theme the story times around biking. So there were a series of different story times that had biking incorporated. They also ran a uh, bike repair clinic down here in the City Hall Plaza. The Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee and then the Eugene Active Transportation Committee this year worked across the region to register more businesses as being bike friendly through the Travel Oregon program. So that's a program that's really trying to help promote businesses that are bike friendly, encourage them to be more bike friendly, whether it's installing a bike rack, offering free water to fill up water bottles, the types of services that people touring through our community by bicycle would want to be able to stop in for a snack, a quick repair, a restroom, those sorts of things. And we had uh, great success with getting a number of new businesses uh, recognized, just distributed the final signs that we were able to help purchase <coughs> recently to those businesses. So you'll see more of those signs up in the right corner popping up with the businesses and what they offer in the community. Uh, Safe Routes to School has the challenge and their numbers were I think the highest they have been this past year. It was really impressive how much uh, participation there was. City of Springfield has put on wheels by the Willamette, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, and then, you know, there were a number of other events. As Shane said, it's probably well over 50. We start out the month, and then people continue to add events throughout. And one of the important pieces is there's these events happening during May, but it's an opportunity to plug in, get to know about maybe a monthly bike ride that's happening, and then people can start building community and connecting to resources that go all around the whole calendar year instead of just the month of May. So specifically uh, this year, we had some great media coverage. Um, the NBC 16 and actually live streamed the Wheels by the Willamette event on TV. That was a first for us. We also had a May is Bike Month uh, story out on the North Bank path there on the right that was on the front cover of the Register Guard. Um, and there were numerous social media, newsletter, staff emails, newsletter, uh, other e-newsletters that go out beyond your more traditional media um, hits that we show here. Yeah, so looking forward, we're excited to uh, expand May's Bike Month and gather more partners, uh, more communities besides just Eugene and Springfield, but look uh, throughout because now it's We Bike Lane and we hope to involve uh, communities throughout Lane County and encourage them to hold some events. Uh, I know that um, we're going to have some, uh, some interest. I've heard some rumblings and uh, we want to grow programs that we're already doing, but also encourage more organizations and community members to host their own events and really make uh, May a strong month for kicking off that spring and summer riding. Uh, 
Uh, and so the number of, ev of events that we do, uh, encouraging other people to hold those, but then also grow the numbers in the events that we are holding. And one of those that I know will be focused on in Eugene is uh, Springfield started their bicycle friendly business uh, workshop and we last year tagged on, or this past year tagged on and held a separate event. So we had two different events going on for businesses. And we had a really great response from businesses not only to apply to be a bicycle friendly business, but who wanted to know what they could do even if they didn't go through the application process, if they weren't a, a sort of tourist or front facing business, if they were just uh, an organization that had employees, what they could do to encourage people to ride uh, more often. And so being able to connect with those businesses and give the, those resources uh, was a great tool beyond just the encouragement uh, aspect of holding an event like that. So I want to reach more of those uh, connections with businesses and then uh, encouraging more new riders, uh, really working on this idea of the bike buddy and if you have a friend who hasn't tried riding, coming out to these <coughs> events is a great time to uh, feel that encouragement. The bottom left corner picture there is a diversity ride that was held in Eugene and really brought out some newer riders uh, who might not have come out before and, along with experienced riders who uh, ridden so much they knew how to haul their dog. <laughs> uh, and so we're very excited for that and I think that one of the pieces is also that in in both the Safe Routes to School world and in, in our walk and roll challenge and business community challenge is that in a way we're over challenged in our region we have uh, a lot of events that happen and so this is a way to consolidate them in May but then we also do a lot in October uh, we have the get there challenges coming up uh, and that's you know, something that happens statewide. And so it's a way for us to sort of focus our uh, marketing and our outreach efforts into uh, really consolidated events. Briefly, um, I'll just share a personal favorite story from this year. So we were out at the Wheels by the Willamette event on the North Bank Path, and there was Peace Health Rides there to, uh, demoing bikes. There were bike safety checks. The city was partnering with Safe Routes to School doing bike blended smoothies. There was a lot going on, snacks and gifts and all sorts of um, safety information. And this lady rolls up pushing her bike. She's walking and she's got a flat. And here it is, Friday afternoon, she's going home, looking forward to the weekend, and she's thinking, oh, I need to go find a bike shop tomorrow, haul my bike into the shop, figure out how to repair this flat. And then she came upon the event, walked up and said, this made my day. <laughs> because her bike was being repaired over here, she was getting free snacks, and then she was entering to win prizes over here, able to do a, a, coin, or a cornhole toss with the Peace Health bikes, and just having a wonderful time connecting with people, Getting it taken care of, she got home by you know 5:30 on a Friday night. Didn't have to deal with that errand, and she could actually ride her bike the next day instead of dealing with the repair. So that was a highlight for me. With that, and we'll open up for any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Very. Uh, uh, it's not really an update at anymore anymore, but it's a <laughs> it's a it's a briefing. Thank it's you. Planning. We're it's getting planning. Right. We're right. anticipating. We can say we're anticipating the October <laughs> events, right? We're way ahead. We're way ahead. Any other um, any other comments? I'll just have to say that I um, I'm not a confident biker, and so I continually say and have said to Shane, can't you just regard me as the walking mayor? Do I have to be the biking mayor? And he actually even got me on a on a Peace Health Rides uh, bike during the during May. So it was a triumph. Yeah. <laughs> I survived. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your report and for your work. Okay, uh, I'm just going to give everyone a little time check. We have 10 minutes for follow up next steps, and then hopefully we'll be right on time for the cable commission meeting. So. Uh, we'll run through this ODOT. Oh, wait, have I skipped the legislative update? No, no. it's coming. Okay. Um, ODOT update. Yes, please. Um, I guess our big news, our most current big news, is that we've let the contract for the Beltline at Delta interchange improvements. So I'm really excited about that. We have. Uh, <coughs> We have an apparent low bidder, so which means we're going through all the machinations of checking the numbers and such. So hopefully we will have um, a notice to proceed in early October. So look forward to more construction out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
So that's our, our big news right now. Great. I know, short-term pain, long-term gain, mm -hmm. right? Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That over and over again. Yes. <laughs> and and go on all there is is the short term. That's right. <laughs> Springfield Main Street update. Anybody to speak yes, with that's that? Me. Yes, Thank okay, you, good. Mayor. Um, projects on schedule. We're in the process of uh, identifying and evaluating pr potential solutions, and we've expanded the scope of the project slightly to include more detailed analysis of the roundabouts. Uh, LTD is contributing some funding for that. We appreciate that. Um, we've notified property owners of the key principles and methodology that we've developed for the project that's required by state statute, this so-called Senate Bill 408 Access Management Rule. Uh, we'll be hosting a second online open house event late in November that will extend through January. And the next city council briefing is on November 12th. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up is a legislative update. I'll just briefly mention three things. First of all, in your packet, I put in the ODOT transportation uh, legislative summary and referenced in the cover memo a couple of the resources if you want to go beyond that summary. So I'm not going to talk about the legislation itself given the time frame we have for today's meeting. Second thing is, I will mention, if you haven't heard, that there has been introduced in the U.S. Congress a uh, transportation reauthorization bill. Good news is it would reauthorize um, the MPO funding and the work that we do. It would um, reauthorize FHWA highway funding. The bad news is it's only a reauthorization for the highway side of things. It doesn't include transit. It doesn't include rail or Amtrak. It doesn't include... Um, aviation and other things. And while I'm optimistic, um, although it's hard to predict these days, but I'm optimistic Congress will probably pass this reauthorization more quickly than they have in uh, past reauthorizations on the highway side, given um, a fairly bipartisan support. It's unfortunate that uh, there could be a little bit more of a battle and a, a drawn-out timeline for getting reauthorization for transit and rail and other things like that. Uh, but we're keeping an eye on that bill, and we'll bring you an update if it moves forward. Uh, third thing I'll mention really is a result of legislation, which just you hadn't heard. Uh, LCOG was awarded the funding for the two transit routes that we applied for, and as of yesterday, I guess we're operating the Forest to Yahats route, and we got the funding for the Forest to Eugene transit route. Oh. Um, pretty big deal there. We're putting together the pieces. We hope to have that running by January or February. Wow, that's great. Great, thank you. Any, any other comments, additions, questions? All right. Well, that, thank you. What, Lane Act update. Yes. Uh, the next meeting is next Wednesday, September 11th. The meeting will be in Florence. This is the third year in a row that we've had a special meeting out in Florence. We do have a abbreviated agenda. We will be talking about regional priorities and providing an update on the uh, ODOT director search. But a big part of the program will be Florence talking about its public facilities, new things that are happening in uh, Florence. They're especially proud of the new streetscaping on US 101, an ODOT project, but we've been collaborating carefully with the city on that, and they've actually contributed some funding. Uh, that's next Wednesday. Okay, great. Ompak. Two things I'll mention about OMPOC. Uh, the next meeting is October 11th. Um, Rogue Valley area, I believe it's going to be Central Point, but um, that is coming up soon. The other thing I want to mention is that at the last meeting, um, at the, I think it was the end of August, we, or no, early August. <laughs> <laughs> July. <laughs> July. July 30. Okay, I should have just said last summer. Summer. Yes. Summer. 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 Last meeting, whatever it was, doesn't matter. Um, OHOC basically gave staff direction, which OHOC staffs on, to start planning for an OMPOC event, a statewide event open to more than just OMPOC. We're targeting November of 2020 for that mm -hmm. event. Um, we've done this a couple of times before as OMPOC. But the reason I want to mention it today is because week after next, you should all be getting a survey from Kelly, and that's going to go to all of the MPO members, not just the OPOC 
we have a representative for all of the MPO board members throughout Oregon asking for ideas around the topic for the event. Uh, at the last meeting, OPOC discussed some possibilities. They talked about um, equity. They talked about climate change. They talked about various things that could be the focus of an event. But we um, received direction to send out a survey to all of the MPO board members. So you should be seeing that again the the next. Okay. Great. And MTIP. Again, there's a summary of all the administrative amendments that your advisory committee has <coughs> processed and passed over the past couple of months, and we're happy to answer any questions. Great. And are there any questions? Any comments about uh, next steps, any items for the agenda? Commissioner? Uh, just that the county is working on a um, uh, climate action plan, mm -hmm. and that uh, at some point, not um, not building on the agenda for next month, but at some point uh, when the county uh, gets, and I, is Mr. No, Mr. Hurley had to leave, but uh, uh, at some point, perhaps uh, Dan Hurley, Lane County Public Works Director, or someone uh, would come and talk about what the county's doing in the whole climate change uh, arena. Great. Okay. Transportation being one of the most significant parts of, uh, of uh, you know, adding carbon to the atmosphere. Right, absolutely. Any, any other items, comments about the future agenda? Yes, um, I would just want to put out there that it would be great for LTD to do an update on transit tomorrow oh, as great. we have moved even more forward with it on our board level um, just so that this body can continue to remain apprised of what we're working on. Large system wide change. Right, so. right. That, thank you. That would be, I think, very helpful. Great. Any others? Okay, I think, congratulations. Four <laughs> minutes early. We'll close the MPC meeting and opening a meeting of the Metropolitan Cable Commission. Forget your surveys. Oh yes, thank you for saying. I was going to say that. So. Yeah, I don't even need to be. Yeah, we can. Are you going back to the shop? No, I have to pick the restaurant today. Oh, it's going to be a lot. But you're fine. You'll get a survey. We're all taking turns. <laughs> So now, where are the cable cars going to be going? Yeah. <laughs> are they electric? <laughs> are they electric? Will LTD be running these cables? That's right. Or will LTD have the contract? Are you enjoying this work now? Eight full months? Okay, ready for the cable commission? Yep. Everyone made the transition successfully to the next big issue. Thank you and welcome. Do you want to just introduce yourself? Yes. And so my name's Ann Davies. I am an employee at LCOG. Um, I'm here as the cable commission staff person. Um, so we also you have an audience full of cable people behind me um, who are the jurisdictions staff also. So the Eugene, Springfield, and Lane County staff that I've been working with for the last couple of years dealing with uh, franchise renewal and um, audit or fee review for the franchise that the three jurisdictions have with Comcast. Um, we also have a representative of Comcast here, Sherry Ecker, if you wanted to raise your hand, um, came today to um, observe. She's been working with Tim Goodman, who is our the contact that we've been having while we've been working on the renewal. Um, he's busy, and Sherry came down because she's going to start working on these um, this franchise with Tim and wanted to see the MPC or the Cable Commission in action. 
Um, I wrote up a memo that's intended to give you a broad overview and an update on some of the things that are happening at the federal level with an FCC order that recently came out. I know some of the people here are newer and may not live and breathe franchises, um, <laughs> but as some of the more relatively new people will tell you, you just kind of just have to jump in and, and get your feet wet and learn as you go. I'm not gonna kind of give the whole history of how franchises work, um, but as I talk, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we have half an hour today. Um, feeling kind of greedy with the time here. Um, so I just want to give a, a quick recap, ask any questions as we go, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end to kind of brainstorm and, and ask more specific questions. Um, and staff's here also to answer specific questions from the different jurisdictions. So in the last two years or so, we've been working with Comcast on a free review and a renewal of the existing franchise. The franchise that we had I think expired originally in 2019. Um, so those were kind of two separate avenues that we were taking. The, the fee review has been resolved. So last spring, the Cable Commission finally determined on some, the, the dollar figures that um, Comcast was gonna pay to the different jurisdictions on what, what we argued were unpaid franchise fees. So that's been resolved, there's been settlement agreements um, signed by all the jurisdictions and the Comcast has actually sent the checks to the jurisdictions. So that's behind us. Um, we still have the renewal. What we did last spring is we extended the deadline on the current franchise to next summer. Just wanna remind you where we were of that. So it's June something of 2020 is when the franchise is still good for. And the idea was that we would get together with Comcast and continue to negotiate. There was one issue, sticking point, that we just couldn't come to agreement on. Um, the jurisdictions weren't willing to budge and Comcast wasn't willing to budge and so we decided to punt for a year or so. So we haven't gotten back together with Comcast to, to talk about that term, but in the interim, in August, there was an order that came down from the FCC um, that deals with cable franchising. And it kind of changes a lot of the playing field of what we've assumed had to be the case in the past. Um, I put in the packet um, a summary from a national organization that summarizes the order. It's an organization that um, helps um, local governments deal with these types of issues. And they're a great resource and they you know, the second an order is issued, they've got a five-page summary that they send out to all the different members, um, cities and counties around the country. So I've, I've added that. Some of it's a little wonky um, because they do, as I say, live and breathe this stuff. And so they have certain terms that they just assume everybody knows and they don't necessarily. So if you read through that and you have any specific questions, um, I and the other staff people here to answer um, when those come up. Um, so the order, the, the FCC order is very lengthy. Uh, I don't particularly advise any of you sitting down to read it because it'll make your head hurt. Um, there are lots of issues involved. One of them is what's called the mixed use issue that it's not something we want to talk about today, but it's something that the city of Eugene has been intimately involved with, with Comcast in the past. Um, and, um, the city of Eugene has actually already filed an appeal of the order with regard to that, that issue, the mixed use issue, which is cable, cable companies providing services that aren't generally cable services, the internet and other things like that. So that's not what we're gonna talk about today, but I wanted you to know that the city of Eugene has already appealed this order um, to, with the attempt to try to get the litigation to happen in the Ninth Circuit. Um, so the two issues that um, I do wanna talk about are um, the issue dealing with the gratis services. Um, in our franchise, there's a provision that, that says that, that Comcast will provide free cable service to government buildings. Um, and we've taken them up on that. And so there's free service to city halls, schools, police stations, fire stations um, throughout the metro area. Um, and that's been a great service that we've taken advantage of and um, have not been charged for. So the order, the FCC order, has made it clear that um, these gratis, what we call gratis services, are no longer really free. 
And that is because the value of those services are going to come off of the franchise fees that we collect from, from, from Comcast. And that is a 5% cap on the, their, their revenues that they get on cable services in each city and county. Um, so the, the gratis services to the public buildings um, are, are going to be taken off of the franchise fees. The other issue is the PEG, the public education and government channels um, that the, the order did not make a final decision on. They said, we don't know what we're going to do with those, whether those are gratis services, and that we're going to value those the same way we do these other things. But So that's in the future. I only put that in the memo because it's in the next year, you're, less than the next year, you, we're going to be dealing with that. So I wanted you to kind of have a heads up that that's in the order. It's They haven't specifically ruled that we need to deal with it yet, but within the next year, we will be. So with regard to the gratis services, um, the 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 FCC order goes into effect September 26th, which is why we are coming to you now instead of October. Uh, we're not asking you to make any decisions or take any action today, but we, need to, you, we needed you to know what the staff is doing to, in order to prepare the jurisdiction and the cable commission to do whatever we need to do around this. Um, so what the staff has done is the 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 staff that I'm working with have reached out to their their staffs in the city. So the city of Eugene's reached out to internal staff at the city of Eugene, and Springfield and Lane County have done the same. Um, we've reached out because the the government buildings have these cable services. So there's a there's a um, a, a way that the cable services come into each building, but then there are cable boxes numerous cable boxes in many of those public buildings. And so the services and the cable boxes um, are part of what allows Comcast to provide these cable services to the public buildings. And right now they're free. Um, as far as I'm aware, none of the cities or the county are, really have an assessment of all those different um, items. Like what building has, has what service, how many boxes there are. Um, so we reached out to Comcast to say, what are you thinking these are worth? We haven't gotten from them numbers of, of buildings, which buildings have that service, and how many boxes or TVs and, and that, but they've given us the numbers, and that's in the packet that I gave you, um, that, that they're looking at. It's an estimate, um, and they've acknowledged that it's an estimate. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of background where those numbers are coming from, and we're hoping to get more of that background information from Comcast. Um, but in the next month or so, staff is going to continue to reach out to um, the, the city departments and the county departments, as well as the schools. And I just want to kind of talk about the schools a little bit, because they're independent organizations that have a different pocket of money than the cities do. So it's kind of an awkward situation, because they're getting those free services also. Um, and if we were to tell Comcast we don't want any of those free services anymore, um, then we would just stop doing it. But if, if, if it's determined that the city wants to continue to provide those services, then we need to figure out which of those services are going to be provided, which aren't, who's going to pay for it. And with the schools, because there's a different pocket of money, um, we're going to have to negotiate with all those, with the school districts on what they can, are continuing to want and what they're not. Um, to make it a little bit easier, um, just so you know that this Springfield and Eugene, at least for now, their staff has told me that they're fine with me letting you know that they're leaning toward we don't want to pay for these services. If they're not going to be free, we don't want them. And part of the reason is just the way technology is moving. Um, a lot of the buildings don't really use these cable services. A lot are going to Internet. Um, the cable services are still available, and my understanding is, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of times they're used for weather, like in emergency situations. People will turn on the TV to, to, to watch the weather, um, and there are just other ways of, of getting that information. So that's going to be kind of a, a conversation that the electeds and the cities, the, the management of the cities and the county will have to be figuring out in the next month or so. Um, and the reason I say in the next month is because, again, the order is going to be effective on September 26th, and we just don't know what, what Comcast has in mind for that date, whether that's a date when they're going to start charging for the services that are already being provided if we haven't told them we don't want them. Um, 
And so that's kind of where we are. My hope is that we will be coming to you again in October because this is just moving so fast. Um, and we'll need to update you again in October. And it may be that there is an action that we ask you to take. Um, and the action that you possibly could take um, would be uh, basically making, making a motion to say, we don't want any of these after having talked to your electeds. And the reason that you might be able to do that is that um, in most situations, the franchise themselves, the franchises that cities have with Comcast and the charters are probably going to have to get renegotiated because the franchises themselves say these services will be provided to this, these buildings. The franchise that we have, and that there's language that I provided you in that extra sheet today that wasn't in the packet, um, allows the planning commission to say, without, without changing the franchise itself, we don't want those services. They're the ones who can say, these are the services we want, these are the services we don't want. And so we think that that is something that this cable commission can do that probably a lot of other cable commissions can't do around the country is make that call without changing the franchise itself. Um, yes, please. Uh, Christina Kraz, I'm the Assistant City Attorney from Springfield. When Ann said that we're leaning towards saying we don't want the services, we're saying we wouldn't want the services as in kind under the franchise. If individual departments or fire stations, library schools wanted cable services, they would just go direct to Comcast the same way that a business owner or homeowner or any other customer would. So there would still be an option to get those cable services. We just wouldn't go through this process of deducting out of our uh, franchise. Right. Uh, Lucy? Yeah, go for it. Um, quick question. Um, you said we don't really have an inventory to know uh, how many of these cable boxes or TVs are being used by different components of public sector. Is that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, we've and been, the city of Eugene, I think, has been working on getting an inventory of exactly okay. what that is. And, and in the event that we eventually do get a list or at least some semblance of a list and we find out well maybe um, emergency services would have a cable right. maybe fire station or at least some fire stations or sheriff's office or whatever and mm -hmm. people that deal with emergencies might want to have that and then maybe like big wigs I guess city managers or people that are in charge of all of that um, maybe they would be in that but you're saying we would just cancel the free part of the agreement, and we wouldn't do that. We would just pay for it, and that would come out of their budget uh, in, any, in the way any other com commercial or residential purchaser would. Yeah, that, that. yeah that's, I think, what Christina was trying to clarify, is that's, that's one of the options of what could happen. What do you think is best, though? What well, I think that's what we're going to be trying to determine in the next month and then present to you in October, unless anyone's willing to, to say that. I think we're still researching and trying to figure it out. Um, and so when I said that I think that at least the city of Eugene and the city of Springfield are leaning toward, like you said, if, if the police needs it and if the fire needs it, maybe we yank them all and whoever needs it purchases it out of their own budget. Mm -hmm. And it's not part of the franchise. What I would say is, I don't know. Go ahead. What I would say is that either way, the order, the um, FCC order allows Comcast to essentially set the value of the free services at whatever market rate is. So we don't anticipate there being any cost savings in terms of um, like getting it for cheaper if it's part of our franchise. And so if we um, have each department or building or whatever contract on their own for those services, it's probably the same cost it's but it's administratively potentially simpler because you're not having to account for those as coming out of franchise um, payments which could be difficult to track um, for staff and could have implications for later audits it's much more straightforward I think to just pay a, an invoice or an account the way that other customers do and then it also provides more flexibility to the um, the department or building who's receiving it on changing what they want to receive um, because they would do that the same way any other customer would rather than having to come back to the cable commission and request adjustments that way. Okay. Uh, round numbers, how much do the three jurisdictions get each year? 
not my expertise. Yeah, anymore. pay them another. Might know more. Mm -hmm. no. Is that yeah. just the, the monetary franchise fees? Yeah. How much do the gets? city? How much do the city of Eugene get? Lane County, City of Springfield. In the that goes to the general fund in the right of way use fee yeah. for the five percent cable TV. It's about two million. About, yeah, a little over two million a year. That's for city of Eugene. For city of Eugene. What about Springfield, Lane County? Seven hundred thousand, roughly, for Springfield. No, Four hundred fifty thousand for Lane County. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? After. Oh Mayor, no, Mayor, okay. Commissioner. No, no, please. Mayor. So, <laughs> In, the, in our streaming world, in our world of Wi-Fi capabilities and what you can pick up via um, the internet, it really is less and less um, important to have a strictly cable system for getting, unless you've got, I don't know, I think you can probably stream Game of Thrones or whatever, and it's <laughs> HBO. Anyway, uh, but you don't have, I'm just using probably the one that has, you know, had a huge viewership. No, anyway. Um, I can relate to this, Joe. Please. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's Game of Thrones. Oh, my Lord. You've been under a rock. Anyway, um, the. <laughs> Anyway, the, uh, but the point is, is that so much is available. You don't have to have. C cable the way we used to have mm -hmm. cable, where that was our source right. of information or weather or whatever, that pretty much everything you can get via another uh, method. So um, I'm, I'm going to say that we had a conversation and it seemed like that it, it made sense to uh, take a look at the other, how else people get all of their information and what would be useful for departments and if they want to have a subscription, great. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, to continue and then have it have basically be charged for the fact that, you know, we're, uh, it's not free anymore, mm -hmm. uh, is not worth it. Yeah. Commissioner? No, this is for clarification for me. I, I absolutely concur with what I heard, but um, I once had the opportunity to um, be quite familiar with the Comcast corporate culture, at least two pieces of it, their real estate division and their sustainability uh, efforts. And that was in Los Angeles where we audited and did work on two of their facilities. Um, and so understanding their culture as I do, I'm guessing that this FCC order will increase their revenue. <laughs> well, yeah, that's for it. <laughs> that, that's the idea. Um, and very interesting point that I'll just throw out there is that some of the experts have identified a provision that arguably could require them to pass through the savings onto the subscribers. Really? Yeah. And that, that's to be determined? Yeah. That's not even mentioned in the order, but okay. people are talking about that. that that's fascinating. Um, and as it relates to rates, um, is there any sort of accountability in the company's determination of what market rates are in an environment where they have the franchise? Yeah, it's, that's, again, a big, big topic of debate is what's market value and how is it going to be determined? And um, I believe that the numbers that are in the chart right now are based on a rate that is a commercial rate. Um, the commercial rate's higher than a residential rate. Right. Um, but they do have existing rates that at least are some sideboards to determining what that market value is. And last question, thank you very much, Chair. Um, it feels to me in your presentation that this is happening very quickly. And it feels, my sense is it's happening faster than on the ground people are ready to really thoughtfully respond to. Yeah. What is your anticipation of the time frame moving forward for some of these decisions and clarifications? So I'll give you the, the order, I mean, the order is vague in a lot of ways. Um, it doesn't require, it doesn't specifically require the cable companies to give notice of, you know, what they're going to be charging. So we, we actually got these numbers because we reached out to Comcast. The order does not require a cable company to provide that information or to seek to start negotiations with local governments. Um, but there is a anticipation, I think I had in my memo, kind of a suggestion in the order that says the cable companies and the local governments will negotiate what this is going to look like so that 
presumably there would, would be an opportunity for the local governments to say, actually, we don't want these services. Um, and so the, the no, no, timeline is um, in the order as a suggestion of a reasonable amount of time to conduct those negotiations is 120 days. Mm. So. Yes, one last. I'm mm. sorry. Go for it. No, go for it. So this is occurring all over the country. Are, are there networks now forming of, of municipal governments and other entities so that they can compare how their negotiations are going and what best negotiation practices and outcomes might be for the public interest? Yeah. Is this an, actually an area where the, the local governments are work really well together? There's an organization called NATOA, National Association of Technology Advisors, Officers or something. Um, and they have a big conference that we're, a lot of us are going to um, in two weeks. And they have calls. So you're on it. Yeah, yeah, and Pam, Pam's been on it forever um, and knows everybody and knows all the issues. But yeah, really, really um, closely connected in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. A any other questions? I just, I, I know you went over this and it's probably in the packet, just a clarification about the impact on the public schools. So the public schools are in the franchise. It says Comcast, you as part of this franchise will also provide these free services to public schools. And so my understanding is that almost all of the schools within this area, whether it's Springfield, Eugene, or Lane County, do have some of those free services or have right. availed themselves of those free services in the past. Um, so what we've been doing is reaching out to the schools and saying, you get these services for free, um, explaining what the order says to them and explaining that probably Eugene, Springfield, and Lane County aren't going to decide to pay for them for the schools. Right. Um, so we may be in a situation where it will be up to you to decide whether you want to keep those services and pay for them or whether you just don't want to have them. So we're reaching outside of this. The cities and the county are reaching outside their own juris organizations right. to try to touch base with the schools. Right, so that's a that's a that's gnarlier. Yeah, that's that's it's definitely gnarlier. that's gnarlier because they're counting on that service, and now it's a it's a budget item for right. them. And in the county, which I didn't even realize until yesterday or today, when Christine Moody told me, is the county is dealing with, you know, two handfuls of districts. Right. The city just has you know two districts, but the county has all these different tiny little districts that they and they don't even know who out to reach out to yet. And so. so in your conversations with the school districts, are they, do they have the same sort of sense about the trajectory of technology that they're more likely to lean on internet in the future anyway and that the loss of the cable may not be worth the money to them? I have not had conversations with the school districts and I don't know if the staff can answer that or wants to answer that. Uh, in Eugene, my, my bit of outreach, and unless Mike's heard differently with Bethel and 4J, um, the telecom staff say, oh, the classrooms have moved to the internet for the most part. However, the figure that you see here mm -hmm. speaks otherwise. Right. So it may be that the schools have boxes but never turn on the TVs. Right. Or they have the boxes and that's what Comcast is using to develop a one box equals ATV equals mm -hmm. X dollars a month, even if the TV's never turned on. Right. So that's what we're in the fact-finding okay. phase right now. Right. So the schools, they've had it, and it's been free, so why bother even thinking about it? They may just say, oh, yeah, actually, we don't ever use it. Right. Right. But 120 days, I mean, it feels like a quick turnaround for the schools even to begin to think that through. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is why we've been, as yeah. soon as this order was, came about, we started reaching right. out and... Right, right. Well, yes. Um, one, what do you think of the idea of having the uh, jurisdictions ask their, uh, their uh, people in charge of boxes to just turn everybody's box off and see who, who complains? <laughs> So, the, like, if you turn mine off, I wouldn't complain. Because you wouldn't know it got turned off. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I used to watch it all the time, okay? I don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Got other ways to get the info. So, if you sent, if uh, Christine or some other important person at the county sent out an edict to uh, Comcast to turn everybody's box off, then we might get 20 people out of 
three hundred to complain, yeah. but we could turn theirs back on. Yeah. And then the second thing is, can we write a letter? Can you guys write a letter for consideration at our next meeting that says, um, "Gosh, we're so happy to implement this this FCC order. We're we're going we're on it. We're either going to take them take the free service that comes out of our hide, or we're going to pay for it." We haven't decided, or maybe by then we will have decided. But now it's going to save so much money. We want that money to go back to the ratepayers. We are so happy that this economy can happen. And so we want Congress or FCC or somebody, uh, you guys can uh, fill in the blanks here. Uh, we want to make sure that that happens. And we're just one of the million cable commissions out here in America. But, you know, we're, we're going along with it. But, by the way... Since you haven't addressed where the money's going to go, we'd like to give you a suggestion. You should go back to the rate payer. So a letter from the Cable Commission? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Signed by our illustrious chair, mm -hmm. if the commission agrees. If the commission agrees, I'm, I'm sure we can draft yeah, something. Yeah, and who up. would that go to? Would that go to Congress or FCC or who, would that, who, who has the authority to make Well, that so in the, in the conversations that we've been having online, um, the, the recommendation really is to reach out to your... Um, Congress. The FCC is, you know, blind ears, I mean, deaf ears at this point. Yeah. Um, but they, they have been recommending to reach out to the um, representatives. And we have a, a congressional delegation that we could write to, and our senators and congressmen can give it due consideration, mm -hmm. whatever that is. But, yeah. So m my only thought in that, I'm kind of looking at Pam as well, is thinking that if the city of Eugene has already filed an appeal to the FCC order, I don't, I don't know how that works if we also write a letter saying, or maybe we write a letter saying, well, if it stands, this is what you, I mean, I'm just not exactly sure whether that's too many. She was looking to you on Yeah, that. just, just. Given, given that the Eugene has already appealed the order, um, whether it makes whether sense it's, for the, plan, the cable commission to continue to write a letter like that. Well, sure, because during litigation, you know, you can still employ right. them, I mean, to use the savings okay. or the, the in, in, in some way, just as we're commenting on other proceedings of theirs that, uh, where we think that they overstep their authority. So um, we're appealing the small cell order. Right. We're appealing this order along with cities across the U.S. because they can feel they've overstepped their authority. And, um, uh, but in the meantime, because the order takes effect September 26th, we have reason to believe that on September 27th, they're going to take this out as a franchise fee offset, right. no matter what we, Fair enough. we right. say. Okay. Right. So, okay. Unless we come to some decision right. uh, as a commission to um, rescind the mm -hmm. original request to turn on the right. service. Okay. So is there interest in, uh, in a letter from the commission to the FCC on this issue? I get a head nod or a comment. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would. Okay. I mean, I don't disagree with the letter, but I think that it may be a little bit cart before the horse, just a little. Um, where mm -hmm. I think it deserves inquiry to the cable service provider, asking them up front if this is, you know, if this is the case or if you're planning on doing this, where are those funds going to be going? And then when we, but the answer could be that they, oh, we plan on returning them to the ratepayers, and it's like, okay, well then. That's cool. We got it in writing, but if they say, "Well, that's going to be retained for profits," then it's like, "Okay, well, then we should say what we should want to say on the letter." I mean, a little bit of checking it seems like a little bit of homework mm -hmm. is deserved. Well, it sounds like they're going to get the money. It sounds like they're going to get the money. Well, what do you mean they're going to get? They're going to get the money either from us out of our franchise fee, or they're going to get the money from us to pay for whatever. Cable TV services we use. Yeah, if the order stands right. and right, so they're going to get more money. What are they going to do with it? Well, they're probably going to keep it. But I agree. If we can write a letter saying, "Gosh, we just figured out how much money you guys are going to get off of this," so you know, give it to our ratepayers. Let us know if you're going to do that. And if they do that in 30 days, we don't need to write the letter. But if they don't, we better tell our congressional delegation that they're keeping the money. And they've been keeping the money since September 27th. And we can and, inform the delegation right. because we asked them. And, and, we can, and that adds to the point that the benefit of slowing it down and asking them. Right. 
so that it's either you tell us or we're assuming you're keeping it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, take the direction. I'll take direction from the yeah, commission. Yeah. And are there other jurisdictions that are doing this, other cable commissions? Yeah, I don't know whether, you know, I'm sure they're coming, their letters coming from cable commissions and mayors and you know, different officials and yeah. capacities. Yeah. yeah, Commissioner. Just a, just a thought. If very quickly, like days, you have examples of letters to this effect that have come from other cable commissions, mm -hmm. I would like to see them. Yeah. Um, and then it would make sense. I would suggest that more the tone of Mr. Pishinary than the tone of Mr. Sorensen. But, but <laughs> <laughs> we want it back. But a, a, but a letter of inquiry, a, a polite letter of inquiry to the company, mm -hmm. and then with a time frame that we would appreciate knowing by and, and then be prepared based on that to either write a letter or not. I think that would be a process that would give us the most information and, and hopefully the most impact. And, and I would just say that I'm fine with all these suggestions. Uh, I would just add that uh, since there are other people ahead of us that are probably doing this already, either asking their cable provider what's going to happen to the money or people that are more on the saber-rattling end of give it back and give it back now and, and threatening to sue them for failing to give it back now, whenever now begins, September uh, 27th. There's also um, the congressional side of it, which is asking Congress to step in and clarify that they have to do that. So I think there's a number of different things, and what a great timing that you guys are going to this conference and can scarf up all these different examples of letters, both hot-tempered and polite and direct and vague or whatever, and bring your recommendation to our next meeting. Yep. Scarf up. Scarf up. <laughs> That's a good verb, isn't it? Isn't that a good verb? Oh. Yes, Mayor. So where did the numbers come from? Comcast. They gave us numbers, so. Yeah. Yeah, we reached out and asked because we knew we were coming here and we wanted to have some idea of what we were looking at as far as the numbers. It's not real, it's not money really right now. Not right, right now. It yeah. could be as soon as the 27th though. Because they're not paying the franchise against it. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're not, right now what they do is we get 5% of their revenues. Right. Yeah, I and they provide. so I'm trying to think, you know, okay, where's the money really and will mm. they alter their numbers? So they if they want it, if we bit. expect them to give it back to the rate payers, if they'll go, didn't do that math right, yeah. and refigure it. Yeah. Can they do that? Can they go, oh, we didn't mean 193000 We meant, meant 30000 Well, what, yeah. what we're anticipating, I mean, Pam and I were chatting, and we, what, what we could be anticipating is that when, when we get the fees, the quarterly fees at the end of the quarter, which will be sometime some months after September 27th, mm -hmm. the numbers will look different. I mean, that arguably could happen. I don't think it's going to happen with us, but it could happen in other jurisdictions where they get their, their fees and they're lower because they've done the math themselves and they've just decided to deduct them from the franchise fees. And then you can either litigate or talk about it or argue yeah. about it at that point. Yeah, that could happen in some places. That's what I'm trying places. to say is there's right. two scenarios right. anyway yeah. Yeah. of how this would get handled. Yes, mm -hmm. and I think, I mean, I do think um, we've been in conversation with Comcast, and I like to believe that, you know, we have a pretty good working relationship, so um, we'll see. You're we'll see what happens. <laughs> and the, fact, the fact is you can't do litigation until you prove a loss. Yeah. So, right? Hold on, Joe. No litigation yet. Just a letter. <laughs> I'm already going to the next one. <laughs> so just... Just to be clear about going forward, I, I'm, I'm hearing that we would like to just, that this is just, it, you, if you will track this information a little bit yes. about inquire. what the, inquire about whether there is already in the document uh, returning those savings back to the rate holder. If not, if other jurisdictions are well, following this pathway. Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely be talking to people at the right. NATOA conference. Um, arguably, if, if, by next month, we've figured out that nobody wants the services and no one wants the boxes, and we provide notice that we don't 
we don't want this gratis service anymore, so don't take it off of our fees, then we don't have to that's right. figure it out. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So right. not to, I, I guess I, what, that's what I'm saying is we're not asking you to act right away on yeah. this because things we may, may shake out. Right it, it might not be relevant. Yeah. So, okay. We might be that one jurisdiction that has the great story of that's how right. we got it resolved in a month. <laughs> 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 that's right. Okay. Well, uh, any other final comments? Because we're a little bit over time. So thank you, thank you. very much. That adjourns this meeting. Thank you so much.